I'm Joanne Williams, and welcome to a special edition of Black Nouveau. Today, this is called the James Grappy Unity Bridge. Fifty years ago, it was just the 16th Street Viaduct. On August 28th of 1967, about 200 people, including members of the NAACP Youth Council, marched across that viaduct into Milwaukee's south side. They were protesting the lack of open housing in Milwaukee. The resistance they met and their struggle for a basic American right is part of our city's heritage. We'll tell you that story and look at how much things have or have not changed in 50 years. About 50 years ago, hidden behind stained glass windows, safe behind gray fences, and quiet behind locked doors where the silent and the seated, refusing to give a heartbeat's notice until the hands of misfortune came, knocking on their doors, creeping over their fences, and compromising their sanctuaries. That has nothing to do with me, is what they said, until the issue paid them the same unforgiving visit that paid me, paid their neighbors, and one day paid their children. They found monuments of justification they constructed, convincing themselves that women's rights, that was a women's issue. Equal rights, that was a black issue. Poverty was just an issue for the poor and police brutality, that was an issue for the criminals. But apathy and ignorance found its cunning way of wrapping its cold hands around the necks of cowards. It choked the life out of hope and stole the vision from with liberty and justice for all. The fullness of life didn't materialize until wool was removed from mankind's eyes, revealing to him the value of all lives, the same lives that patronized the same prize that my ancestors sang about keeping their eyes on. So when those cowards who have slept through humanity's tribulations finally woke up, they quickly saw that just as easily as those issues stumped up my front porch, it stumped up theirs and a million more. And we need to remind ourselves that we have to have the strength that has kept them inactive, hidden behind stained glass windows, safe behind gray fences, and quiet behind locked doors. We shall overcome, we shall overcome. We call it the modern civil rights era, those years in the 1950s and 60s that brought about social change and the promise that all Americans would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. By the 1960s, there had been uh, pockets of success. Uh, there had been long-standing activism across the country. It was not only a, a southern movement, it was a, a movement that uh, looked unique in particular places. Uh, it, it was in many respects a movement of movements. So by the 1960s we get to a point where we start to see the peaking of some very important developments. Uh, we see the federal government taking ownership of its responsibility to respond to the needs of those who have been uh, essentially denied full citizenship for almost a century. So the 60s was a very, very interesting moment where we see social activism peaking, we see uh, federal government activity playing a role in the process in important ways, but we're also in the middle of some very significant changes economically that help to forecast some of the challenges that we're still grappling with. The battle for civil rights was being fought not only on a national stage, but in state and local areas as well. Fair housing was a major challenge. Milwaukee's black population had grown greatly since World War II, but construction of the interstate reduced available housing and restrictive covenants were still in effect. That Lloyd Bobby is in the early 1960s is saying fair housing is really the key component to making a change, and so he has this uh, week-long uh, fair housing uh, set in around the rotunda, rotunda capital. Uh, so there's a lot happening. The NWCP is coming alive uh, through their young people that they have, although they're in disagreement with the activities of the young people, uh, they still are supporting them. And then finally, we, we got the uh, fair housing, desegregation of the school systems, and the riot that, that happens all in the 1960s. In 1962, Alderwoman Val Phillips introduced the citywide open housing ordinance and was outvoted 18 to 1. I, I did try to, uh, as I said, to appeal to a sense of justice, 
but it's quite apparent to me that the members of this honorable body, to put it in, uh, well, to put it in the terms of my commando friends, these cats are just too dumb, <coughs> just too dumb to know when they have something going for them. The NAACP's Youth Council was already involved in protesting racial injustice. They joined the fair housing battle. I've been in Milwaukee all my life, and I know my parents had a problem when they purchased a home outside of the, we called it the ghetto at that time. And uh, the owners of the home didn't know that they were black at the time. Well, when they, when they found out that they were black, they uh, attempted to renege on the uh, offer to sell the house. Well, my parents hired a, a lawyer, and uh, as it turned out, we ended up getting a home. So I, after moving into that area, which was predominantly white at the time, uh, I got to see what racism was. Coming from the south side of Chicago, everything and everybody that served us was black. So when we got to Milwaukee to hear about all this stuff, it, it was very foreign to me because, you know, I was really in culture shock to come to Milwaukee and find out that everything wasn't black. So um, when I found out what we were getting involved in, I was kind of afraid, but wanted to be with everybody else, so we went for it. When the Youth Council would march in protest, the commandos would protect the marchers. There were a variety of people with, within those marches, and the commando's position and responsibility was to safeguard them from harm. Very often it was the commandos that needed to be safeguarded from the police. The Milwaukee Police Department would follow us, the, uh, the detectives would follow us, and uh, they would pull us off to the side, put guns to our heads, call us out of our names and threaten us. Uh, some commandos uh, we thought had deserted us and we found out later they had been arrested with no charges and they were in jail, in the city jail. You know, I found that out when I got arrested. On August 28, 1967, about 200 marchers crossed the 16th Street Viaduct headed towards Milwaukee's south side. When we got to the bridge, everything was in that bridge is forever. I mean, when you step on that bridge, and the further you get across that bridge, and you know what's waiting on you, it gets more, more, and more tense, okay? So um, when we got to the end of that bridge, we had a reception waiting on us, and we had more Jews. And it was building and building and building. When we got to the end of the bridge on the south end, we were met by this angry, angry group of people. I mean, they were calling us all kinds of things. Um, the, the, the police officers were standing ready, but I didn't understand who they were ready for. The 200 were met by thousands and had to retreat we are going to march again on the south side this evening. We're going to begin here at the Freedom House at 6 o'clock, and we're going to take the same route that we took last night. The next night, they were met by an angrier crowd and the national news media. The incident caused Milwaukee to be dubbed the Selma of the North. The Youth Council marched for 200 nights. The federal government passed the National Fair Housing Act in April of 1968. Many historians note that the Milwaukee marches were instrumental in getting that legislation passed. Fair housing for all, all human beings who live in this country is now a part of the American way of life. Is that part of the American dream more available to people of color today than it was 50 years ago? I'd love to say that it's uh... It's, it, it's a better situation than it was 50 years ago. Um, I, I would love to say it's better than it was five years ago, but the reality is for most 
low to moderate income families in the city of Milwaukee, they're worse off uh, in terms of their housing situation. Well, in the last four years, uh, five years, we know that the gap between uh, home ownership for white households um, has grown to 69%, and for African American families, it's about 28%. And that gap has grown over the, la the, the last five years. So where you live determines where you go to work. Where you go to work determines what, what, what kind of a livelihood you have for your family with education and, and those types of quality of life issues. All of that's determined by where you live. And if, you, if you're not where the jobs are, then in fact you are uh, going to be stuck in a more increasingly po impoverished area. Since 1977, the Metropolitan Milwaukee Fair Housing Council has fought for fair and open housing in Wisconsin. Essentially, our goal as a nonprofit is to assist in enforcing pri private, uh, federal, state, and local fair housing laws. So as a private entity, we are kind of restricted based on how funding flows and uh, uh, political will to make sure that this is an issue that continues to be on the uh, forefront of civil rights. This is not a, a civil rights issue that many people you know, think still exist. Uh, and many people don't get behind it because, well, there's places that will take care of that. There's a federal government, there's a state, when in fact uh, neither of those has adequate uh, resources or provides adequate resources to address that problem. So 50 years later where we are and why we are where we are is based on the fact that people don't really, this has always been kind of a stepchild of the civil rights movement housing. It's been the most hard fought for, Lloyd Barbie. Uh, Val Phillips, uh, other leaders uh, in the, from the state and from local had uh, initially broke ground to do that, but there's been very little movement, um, uh, in fact, to, to try to uh, ensure that this is something that's on the social justice agenda, and it just, it's, it's been difficult from that standpoint. Milwaukee's Habitat for Humanity is part of an international group. It builds and refurbishes houses, then sells them for no profit to hardworking low-income families. We've made a, a concerted effort, first of all, to address the issue of affordability for low to moderate income families. Um, so we've remained true to our mission as it was started over 30 years ago in Milwaukee uh, to uh, provide new home ownership opportunities for first-time home buyers. And, and that's to uh, uh, make sure that families can afford to stay in their homes long term. Um, so we've been able to serve over a thousand families. Um, most of those, the vast majority of those, are African American families in this city. What was never known is how that there was a true formula established. And the true formula came from the prior servicemen who were in service and who had decided at one time or another that they would ad adopt a military model. This is one of the many meetings held by the March on Milwaukee's 50th Anniversary Committee. Since February of 2016, the members have met in houses of prayer, boardrooms, and virtually anywhere a group, large or small, wanted to understand the importance of the march and how to properly commemorate it. What we found is that the 50th anniversary was a really energizing prompt to a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. The story of the open housing marches as people heard more about it and the way that it's been held within the community just had people really excited about what the 50th could be. Our idea is 200 Nights of Freedom. So, 200, so reflecting the timeline and the spirit of the original open housing marches, we're kicking off on August 28th of 2017 and then having an initiative that runs 200 days, much like the 200 days of marches. Our two big ideas are recognition and reignition. So recognition is a very important idea of learning the history, being inspired by the history of what happened during the open housing marches in 1967 and 68, but then also reignition. When they marched in 1967 and 68, they were teenagers or people in their 20s, even younger than that. So I think the, the spirit of those marches was a young one. It was young people demanding change an uncompromising group of young people demanding change in their community. So I think that the hope of 200 Nights of Freedom is to reach young people today and empower them really to, to enact, enact the, the change they want to see in the Milwaukee that they're inheriting. It's itching, burning, I can't see. Seeing every color with symbols without movement. 
Ghost dials upon four stopping my breathing. I don't understand if I'm dying or falling in love with this drug. I mean, I love it, but I'm not addicted. But I know if I leave it, I'm running back to it. So is it addiction? I can't feel my bones unless I feel them. Listen to Marley and Mary, sometimes it, it confuses my spirit, but I'm living. Dark images in a dark dream. Wonder how I see, I dream as those images uphold me. I find peace in the depth holding me. Waking up, remembering nothing till it hits me, then it hits me. Thinking it snap back into reality, this world's still a fake dream. Back to Martin Luther King had that dream. Black queens and kings still fighting for liberty. Where is our justice? These dreams beat us because we're black. Kill us because white see us as black animals and rape us to destroy us. So what's next? I'm not sitting back no more. This war, my people's freedom is everything. Tired of these dark dreams. Time for a revolution of these dreams are going to keep making history. So what do you believe in these dreams? We won't start until we get justice. Today's young civil rights activists are marching for social justice, economic equality, and human rights. But many are doing more than marching. They're working within our community to make life better and to help provide direction for many of our young people who might otherwise not have it. This video was made at Urban Underground. The organization was established in 2000 to address critical issues facing adolescents in Milwaukee. Enrique Marguilla works for Public Allies, part of AmeriCorps Service Network. He is stationed with Urban Underground. So here at Urban Underground, I'm a program coordinator where I um, use art as a catalyst for social change. So I teach young people how to screen print t-shirts and then turn it into a sustainable business. So we have a couple um, financial literacy courses that we incorporate with the screen printing. Um, it's kind of just using a fun thing to get the youth engaged to um, like some tackle some societal issues that they face. Joblessness and poor education are the root of violence, I believe, and by allowing the young people to get money um, in, in a positive way allows them to not have to resort to these violent, violent acts. Um, and it, it teaches them like social justice, um, um, social justice ideas, so it teaches them that they can make a better way by doing something positive and we use social justice images to remind that these are the people that um, may change in the past and it just gets them thinking about um, bettering their community and bettering themselves. Here I am a youth member of Urban Underground and I do the screen printing with Enrique as well as a lot of youth justice. I get back into the community. We also do a lot of community events. We go pre-college tours. We get to see Milwaukee in different views. All of us who are a part of the screen printing program, we have our own ideas. So first logos we do is basically anything we can imagine. What we can put on paper, we transform it to a screen and then we turn it into a t-shirt. But then we also have our regulars. So we have like Father Grab, Martin Luther King, we have Black Power. It's many different shirts, Water is Life as well. We have about 10 that we normally do. And we're joined now by three former members of the NAACP Youth Council who marched across that bridge 50 years ago. Dr. Peggy Rosga, who was also the widow of Father James Grappi. Fred Reed, whom you met earlier in the program. He was a commando too. And Prentice McKinney, who's no stranger to Black Nouveau, who was also a commando. Prentice, how old were you when you went across the bridge? Yeah, about 18, 19 years old. Did you have any idea what you were going to face? I don't think any of us did until we were actually there um, and it confronted us. But no, initially um, we had been marching earlier. Marches had been smaller, no confrontation. Um, and as we moved around from Alderman's house and then we chose the bridge. And no, I don't think the city of Milwaukee was prepared for what happened. Peggy, were you surprised at the reaction you got when you crossed into your neighborhood, the South Side? I was. I grew up on the South Side of Milwaukee. I went to St. Mary's Academy High School. We dated boys from Don Bosco, which was nearby. Went out for pizza on 16th Street. I thought, I've been here a thousand times. I was a little concerned because sometimes who you're with makes a difference in how people react to you. And I was no longer with other white kids. Um, so, but, but the degree to which uh, there was hostility 
uh, really did take me by surprise. Were you prepared for it? I mean, you were surprised, but did, did they tell you something may happen? Well, I could tell from how nervous everybody else was that something may happen. But I had been a uh, voting rights volunteer in the South, um, and, and so I had some experience with hostile situations. Um, so in that sense, I was prepared. But this was home, and that made a difference. Fred, you were the oldest of this group. You were, what, 25? 25, 26, somewhere along there. Yeah, so you had a little bit more life experience, but it, was it enough to prepare you for what you faced? Well, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think you're ever prepared when you got um, children that you're responsible for, responsible for. And I felt a strong responsibility, as did my other colleagues, for the children who were in the march. Because some, some of these were um, grade school, you know, some were high school, and there were some uh, senior citizens in there. There's some handicapped people in there. And I think that you begin, it was for the first time I felt myself, I felt the anxiety. You know, I felt, I felt, actually felt nervous. Not so much for myself, but that something might happen. And I didn't know how much I or my colleagues could do to prevent somebody from getting hurt. Now, your purpose for being there was to, to sort of protect. Yeah. Um, the commandos served as protectors for the youth council and other marches. So they had like um, a line form straight up and down each, each, each march from the beginning until the end. And, and, and their job was to keep people from getting hurt, if they could. You were also pretty well organized. I mean, the commandos uh, had been organized before you started marching across the viaduct. You had done other things. So y this wasn't just show up the first night and start walking. You had, you had some experience in, in organizing. Well, yeah. I mean, we, um, we had marched at, like I said, at other aldermen's homes, uh, Eagles Club. So there had been marches going on um, prior to the 16th Street Viaduct. And uh, like any organization, new people join and find their place in. And um, that's how eventually structure was uh, came about with the commandos. As more and more people came in, people took different levels of responsibility and uh, executed those responsibilities. Let me, let me ask you this. What, what happened to you as being a participant of this? Did your life change? Did, did friends react to you differently? Did you, how, how has your life changed by participating? Long term, um, I think so if we're looking at, at the perspective of 50 years distance, um, I now have people say to me, I wish I would have done what you did. I wish I had been there. Or in one way or another sort of ask forgiveness for not having been there. Um, women will say to me things like, well, I had small children. I couldn't be there. Um, short term, in, in immediate reaction, uh, there was... Some, some people distanced themselves from me. I was not invited to one cousin's wedding. Um, I met a high school friend one day at downtown, walking downtown, not a part of March, just being downtown. And uh, she actually recognized me and called my name. And when I turned and saw her, I opened up my arms. I was going to hug her. And she did body language that was very clear. She did not want to touch me. She did not want me to touch her. Um, mm. So, yeah, there was that sort of thing that, that went on. Fred, I understand that you had something happened at work because of your participation? Yeah, that was a life-changing situation for me to go from... Uh, working uh, an eight-hour shift to not working at all. I was really summarily dismissed from my job for even participating in it. And I was outright told so by the superintendent of the company. And they walked me out of the door. They said they're going to have to give me some time off and, you know, probably lose the job. And so um, I really had no problem with it. What it did, I had a problem because it was a little difficult times and, 
and paying the bill. But I had no problem with it because it fueled the fire within me to put participation. So that, that, was, that was my experience. Well, we're going to have to conclude this part of our conversation, but we're going to continue our conversation online, milwaukeepbs.org, so you can hear more of what we talk about when you go online to join us there. What do we do for our community? The sense of unity we lack? We rely on social media to convey our messages. Decades of miscommunication, internalized being misused, misconstrued, tokenized, and not even viewed as human beings. So speak when spoken to. Who cares how you are treated? Keep those secrets, but make sure you respect your elders. Even when they provoking you to throw a bow or two, if no one sees it, then no one's hurting you. So keep quiet. Be our puppets and do our dirty work as you become engulfed in silence. And when they kill your people, that's when you get violent. That's when you riot. They love our violence, but only when it's against our own community. Built the road through our thriving senses of unity. We don't need the chance to speak. So let me type. A generation full of social networking extroverts and realistic introverts speaking up. It just ain't my type. I'm not the type. I'm used to being silent. How about we go make a stand? How about we go march? No, let's just riot. Let's get violent. Let's burn sh down. That's all we know. All we see is vile characteristics and insensitivity. So I'm not happy, but I'm going to pretend to be. And ain't nobody hearing nor listening to me. But all those likes that I got on that Facebook post is showing me that at least somebody is feeling me. And all our leaders either got bullets or a life sentence. So the culture of our empowerment, we often forget it. And we fail because we missing the positivity that rests in the mirror of our backbones. It didn't got lost somewhere between black power and iPhones, and systems that we created to protect us, the system manipulated to tangle our goals and society's expectations and to project us as thugs, hoodlums, and prostitutes and oppress us, and they don't teach us no history. The gold in our melanin is a mystery. We soaked in melancholy misery, and the media only showing that death or incarceration is the only two options for what a black kid can be. We ain't got nobody showing us how to make a stand. All we know is statuses, hashtags, and Instagram posts. So smile for the camera. <laughs> Hashtag Black Lives Matter. Oh, freedom. Oh, oh freedom. Oh, freedom over me. Lord and be 